You know, church, that, that really is the best thing we ever did, isn't it? Stand with me. I want to have you stand with me tonight. We're going we're gonna to pray together before we get into the Word. I want to tell you one thing that the preacher said last night that I'm not sure a lot of places would either agree with or know what to do with. But the, pa- the minister last night at camp meeting is a pastor in the state of Florida. And he has a church, a congregation of a couple thousand people. And uh, he said in one service, he said a whole row of LGBTQ plus people came into the church. And um, then he had a cross-dresser come to the church. And he said the usher came to him and said, Pastor, what do you want me to do with these people? Where do you want me to put them? Where do you want me to seat them? What do you want to do with them? And he said, I don't care where you put them. He said, sit them over there by the adulterers, the fornicators, and the liars. They'll be just fine. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) And uh, that pretty much handled that situation pretty quick, didn't it? Hey, I want to tell you this word is good for all of them. All of us. Amen. It'll take the sin out of anybody's life that's willing to let him do it. Amen. I want us to pray tonight. We're going to have a great time in the Word. We're we're still 40-something weeks later. We're still in the book of Isaiah, and we're going to be. We're going to be at the 49th chapter. But, you know, I I don't want us to just kind of, you know, go right through it without asking the Lord to condition us and prepare us and make our hearts receptive to His Word. Could we do that together right now? Father, in Jesus' name. As we come to this point in the service, we've, we've sung these songs, we've re- rehearsed your promises and your blessings to us, we've uh, celebrated, God, this great salvation you've given through your Son, Jesus, and now we come to the Word, and I pray that you will indeed condition our hearts and condition our minds to hear this Word and receive this Word And Lord, may it be the strength of our life. May the Word of God be the strength of our life. I pray, giving us a biblical worldview. Amen. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And you may be seated. So let me, while you're being seated, let me just kind of quickly go through this. Another current events, if you will. And... uh, keeping you up to date on what's going on and where we find ourselves sometimes as the church in this great nation we live in. This is about three or four days old article that says, uh, Belief in God among Americans has fallen to its lowest level ever. Now, what's, what I, I guess I should preface this. This is both a negative and a positive article. There are some things to frown at in this, and there are things to smile at and rejoice over, so don't get down by those first words, but it is true that as a percentage of the population, we are at the lowest level ever in this nation as it relates to belief in God. Our nation's past is marked with great awakenings or religious revivals. We know that to be true. But by the mid-1980s, America had spent decades removing religious symbolism and imagery from public life. This came in a state form with bans on prayer in school or the Ten Commandments in the courtroom. It also came in corporate forms as brands veered away from religious ideas in their ads. They became all Easter Bunny and no Jesus. So maybe it is no surprise that the youngest Americans, those born after 1990. Now for most of this crowd here tonight, somebody that's born after 1990 seems like a little child. But let me tell you, that takes somebody all the way up to the age 31, 31 years old. So those born after 1990 have the lowest belief rate, 6 out of 10, and suffered the most severe recent drop of 10%. Even a person just 10 years older 
was exposed to much more public religion as a child. Nativity scenes outside of state houses, invocations before sports tournaments were the norm, not the exception. But a case, and this is when it begins to kind of look up a little bit, a case the Supreme Court is set to decide on any day now, by the way, may swing the door back to more open public displays of religion and faith. And you've been seeing this probably in the news, the high school football coach uh, in Washington who was sued for you know, kneeling at, at the 50-yard line. You've been seeing that. And even though he did it on his own and lost his job over it, it's before the Supreme Court now. And it is believed, though we don't ever know till it comes out, but it is believed that Supreme Court is going to rule in his favor. And what this article goes on to tell us is that if that, if that is the case, there is much hope that we will begin to see, as a result of that Supreme Court ruling, we will begin to see many more examples of public display of faith again in our, in our world, in our society, and at our events. I pray that's the case, don't you? I pray that's the case. It goes on to say, even after all the scandals of the past decades and the declining church attendance, the number is pretty stubborn and suggests an America willing to stick with faith. I like that. I'm thankful for that. But without God, and this will be the final word here, without God, we are free to decide what a man or a woman is, even if the result of our effort is a spreadsheet of 47 sets of ever-shifting pronouns. Without God, we determine what is most moral, either saving the climate or bringing people out of poverty with fossil fuels. Without God, we can decide whether to kill a baby or not. Of course, the article goes on to say that without God, we become a law unto ourselves. We decide what's good and what's bad. And therefore, we need the guidance of God. We need the guidance of the Word of God. Amen. And so, some of what is in this article isn't good, but some is potentially good. You keep on praying. You keep on trusting God. You keep on living right and asking for a move of the Lord and I believe we can see it, don't you? I believe in these last days, he'll still pour out his spirit upon all of us. Praise the Lord. So we go tonight to Isaiah chapter 49. And this is not so well known as such, but it is a messianic chapter. In other words, it is a foretelling or a prophecy of the coming Messiah or the coming Christ. Certainly not well known uh, like uh, Isaiah 53, 54, but it is nonetheless. So we're going to read just the first three verses here. And then as we go along, we'll read some more verses in this chapter. There's a lot we could talk about in these 25 verses or so. But there are a couple of things I want us to hit on for sure. It says, Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken, ye people, from Far, The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me and said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Now we'll pause our reading right there, but even in those first three verses of this chapter, we are hearing the prophetic word of the Lord, sort of announcing through the prophet here his own birth, his own calling, his own being sent by God to be the Messiah, the Savior, the builder of his people again. And that's what this chapter is about. That's how this chapter expands. So what when we come to this 49th chapter, we've kind of been following this trend now lately in the book of Isaiah. And that is in the foregoing chapters, the Lord has been comforting His church. He has been building His, 
And when I say church, I mean his people. He's been building his people up with the promise of deliverance. You know, he's going to use Cyrus. We talked about that in the last few weeks. He's going to bring them out of Babylonian captivity. And the Lord has been saying to his people that for all of your sins and for all of your rejection, I'm in covenant with you and you are my people and I will not forsake you. And so the Lord has been lifting them up with those words of encouragement about deliverance from captivity in the following chapters, really sort of like starting tonight and following, the Lord is going to continue to comfort His people and, and strengthen His people with the promise of the coming Christ, with the promise of the coming Messiah. And so praise God, the Lord is not finished with His people. We know that reading all the way through the book of Revelation. So he starts off by saying, listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken ye people from far. What what does he mean by that? What is he saying there? What he's saying is, for he would like for all the world's attention to know what is about to happen. For the whole world to be attentive, to be listening. Because after all, what's going to happen is going to bless the whole world. It's going to affect men and women around the globe. Amen. Jesus is not just the Savior of the United States of America and its citizens. He's the Savior of the whole world. John said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. So attention, all you nations. Attention, all you people. All you isles. Everywhere. Pay attention Well, I'm back on. (laughs) Now, I'm not going to be doing that back and forth stuff tonight. So if it does it again, we'll switch off. So the Lord has called me from the womb. Now, if you think because that's in the first person, the Lord has called me from the womb, therefore that's got to be pastor, that's got to be Isaiah talking. Absolutely not. Because we know that was not the case with Isaiah. We know that Isaiah did not receive his call until when? You remember? You remember when that king died in the year that Uzziah died? Do you remember that Isaiah was not really called to be a prophet until he was of mature age? He couldn't say that about himself. And he's not saying that about himself. He's saying that about Jesus. There can be little doubt. Uh, that he's referring to the coming Messiah. Christ, on the other hand, not Isaiah, but Christ, on the other hand, was designated for his office from the womb. In fact, not only that, he says here, look at it if you will, he says in verse 1, the last line there, that from the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. And I read somewhere in the Bible that before Jesus was ever born, they were told that he was to be named Jesus. Amen. Amen. So clearly we understand who he's talking about here. He says in verse 2, he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. Well, we know who that's referring to. Hebrews chapter 4 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder the soul and spirit. You know, I thought, I spent some time thinking about the power of the word of God, the power of the word of Jesus. Even the power of the word about Jesus. The power of the word of the gospel. Church, it has a power that nothing else can suffice for. It does. It pierces the heart for one. And you know, throughout the word of God, there are numerous examples. All the way over, for example, in Revelation 1 and 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His word is like a sword. Well, what does that mean? Well, a sword not only cuts, but a sword is a, is a, a conquering weapon, isn't it? A sword is what you win a battle with. And here the word of the Lord is being referred to as a sword. 
That's incredible. You know, Napoleon, he conquered the known world. Alexander the Great conquered the known world with a handheld sword. But that's not the kind of sword that he's talking about here. He's not talking about a material weapon. He's talking about the power of the word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you, it was the word of God that got my soul, that got my heart. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. The Bible says you're begotten by the word. Whether you realize it or not, the word of God got inside you and transformed you and changed you and arrested you and got a hold of your conscience. Amen. And it might have been the word in a Sunday school class or it might have been the word somebody was simply testifying to you about. It might have been a preacher's sermon on a Sunday or it might have been a word that came out of a song somewhere. But God takes his word and he puts his anointing and his power on it and it's like a sword. Amen. It conquers. It conquers sin. The Bible tells me that one time and tells you that one time when they were filled with the Holy Ghost and came out of the upper room and Peter stood up and preached the Word of God, 3,000 of them were conquered at one time with the Word. 3,000. That's the power of the Word of God. John 8 and 30, and he spake these words, or as he spake these words, many believed on him. Acts 2, 37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? When did that happen? When were they convicted? When did they change? When did something transformative happen in them? When they heard the word, amen. Don't you ever think there's not power in the word of God, power in your testimony, Anytime you stand to speak of the Lord Jesus Christ and his work, there's power in that word. Amen. Brother Jimmy asked a moment ago for, for us to pray that God would give him the direction and the right words to speak to those that are lost that he works with. I believe the Lord will give him that. And I believe that as he speaks that word about the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be a power in that word that is not found in a normal conversation. Amen. Because his word is is a sword, praise God. Well, he also says in verse 2, he made me a polished shaft. What is that? Well, that's simply a reference to an arrow. An arrow that you would shoot from a bow. An arrow is keener than a sword. It's smooth, it's polished, it pierces deeper it's a piercing arrow. It has swiftness of flight. In fact, he goes on to say, he hides me in his quiver. We know it's an arrow. The word of the Lord, the power of the name of Jesus, the effect of the life of Jesus on somebody is like a polished arrow. It gets right on in there quickly where it needs to be. Don't ever discount the power of the testimony of the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. And then he says something in verse 6 that everybody here can relate to. It was, it was really a lot of the subject matter of the last two nights of camp meeting. In verse six, uh, 4 and six, through 6 he says, Then I said, I have labored in vain and spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work is with my God. You know, the last, the, the two nights of camp meeting leading up to tonight, both preachers, excellent ministers of the word, they both dealt with this very different ways. First night of camp meeting, the preacher preached on the Lord will fill you with hope and with joy and with peace. And he talked about, he took his text out of Jeremiah, and he talked about how, how the days were in the days of Jeremiah. You remember Jeremiah is the weeping prophet. Do you remember they took Jeremiah and threw him into a, into a mud pit? Do you remember that? Do you remember Jeremiah said, I'm so depressed about all of this that I will speak no more. I will have nothing else to say. But then he couldn't stop that because it was like a fire that was shut up in his bones. But he lived in a turbulent time, a wicked time, a disgraceful time. 
And the preacher took that text uh, Monday night and he dealt with how the scripture where the prophet said, but God, thou art my hope. Amen. And he dealt with hope, how that no matter where you are, no matter how discouraged you are, no matter what you've faced and been through, there is hope in the Lord. Amen. The preacher last night took a different text, went a totally different route, but essentially dealt with the very same subject. He dealt with do not give up and do not quit when you are discouraged. You cannot let up, but you stand strong, you stand firm, you fight till the end. Amen. And I want to tell you, those are pertinent words right now. Because so many people are discouraged. So many people are despondent. So many people have come through so much stuff in these last couple of years. We're just now really beginning to see light at the end of the tunnel for a lot of people. And here the prophet Isaiah is not talking about you or me. Here the prophet Isaiah is talking about the Messiah, the Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's Jesus in the first person. I have labored in vain, spent my strength for naught. Did Jesus ever get discouraged? You better believe he did. He went to his own and his own received him not, the Bible says. You think that won't discourage somebody that's fully man? Fully man, fully God, but fully man? You think, you think when Jesus prayed in that garden, Father, if possible, if it could be thy will, let this cup pass for me. You think there's not a, a sense of despondency in words like that? Do you think that, that he didn't? He's touched in every way as we're touched by the feelings of our infirmities. Tempted in all points as we are. And here the prophet says in the first person, in the prophetic word, that the Lord knows the power of discouragement. Now, if the, the Redeemer of the world, the Savior of the world, if Jesus Christ would face discouragement, how are we going to escape facing discouragement? We're going to face it. We're going to face it. Preacher, uh, I believe it was Monday night. The preacher was talking about, he was talking to pastors. And that's a lot of what camp meeting is, though not entirely, but he was preaching to pastors, ministers, and he's, he said, there's a bunch of you that have come here to camp meeting tonight from difficult places in your churches right now. He said, you can't come here and say, we broke a tithe record. And you can't come here and say, We've taken in X amount of members in the last few weeks. And you can't come here and say, we've got so many thousands of dollars in reserve in our funds at the church. He said, you come here just the opposite. It's as bad as it gets. Now, I sat in that congregation. I sat between Gerald McGinnis on one side and Larry Winters on the other side. I sat there hearing that same word. Of course, our wives were there too. But I heard that same word, and I thought to myself, and, and under, I hope I can convey this. I thought, but I have come here able to say that. I have come here saying we've had four tithe breakers in two years. I have come here tonight saying we've taken in almost 50 new members in the last few months. I can come here tonight and say that we've got X amount of thousands of dollars in reserves at our church. I, I can come here and, and say that. And, and for a moment, Brother Johnny almost felt guilty, almost felt bad because of what he was saying there. But I just thought back over the last 40 years. And I thought of how many of those camp meetings I went to when I couldn't say that. 
And I was that preacher that he was talking about. I was that discouraged, despondent one that he was talking about. And I thought, well, God, I'm in a season right now that that's not happening. But I don't know what tomorrow's season's going to be like. I, I know I've been in that season. And I've been in that season plenty. And thank God for his grace. And thank God for his touch. Amen. But every one of us know the power of discouragement. We all do. And that's what he says here. Then said I, I've labored in vain. That's discouragement. I've spent my strength for naught. That's discouragement. I've spent my strength in vain. That's discouragement. Oh, but he lifts our spirits with the next word. Yet surely my spirit is with the Lord, or my judgment rather, is with the Lord, and my work with my God. Hallelujah. Let me tell you what he's saying right there. He's comforting himself by remembering that he's doing what he's doing because he's called of God. He's doing what he's doing because he's commissioned of God. He's doing what he's doing not for himself, not even for the people, but he's doing it in behalf of God. Hallelujah. My judgment is with the Lord, and my work is with my God. And I want to tell you the most sure fire way of getting through discouragement in your service to the Lord is to remember that you're first and foremost, above and before everything else, you're doing what you're doing in the service of God to please God and answer the call of God, not for any other reason. And we will ultimately answer to God and only God. And somehow when somebody does you wrong and somebody lies on you and somebody cheats on you or for whatever reason you're discouraged and down and out, somehow when you remember, I'm not doing this to try to please them or make friends with this one or that one. I'm doing this because I've been commissioned of God and I'll answer to Him that's the greatest reason. Amen. He sends us to people. We have to minister to people. That's the gospel. But we answer to him for it. And therefore, that's our fulfillment. He knows our purposes. He knows our opportunities. And he knows our endeavors. And I'm convinced to this day that that is the greatest. Remember David said he encouraged himself in the Lord. In the Lord. I've wondered, you know, over the years, I've read enough of this over the years, I can't recall them all now, but I've spent enough time reading and studying the lives of people you never heard of, never heard of them in your life, but they were the ones who, res who were responsible for winning a Charles Spurgeon or a D.L. Moody or a Billy Graham or whoever it may be that you do know, that you have heard of. And it was, that, it was that constant labor for God that probably at times felt like I'm laboring in vain. I got nothing to show for it. And then a few decades later, there stands Billy Graham up before hundreds of thousands of people. And you, sir, you, ma'am, are the one who won him to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't tell me it's in vain. Don't tell me it's not, not any good. God keeps a record and God knows how to bring about the results. Amen. Amen. Have you ever had anybody contact you over the years and you'd forgot about them? And they contact you or you'd bump into them somewhere and they'd say, you made a great impact on my life or you, you, you don't know it, but you're ultimately the reason I came to Christ or something like that. Every, every blue moon, every now and then, a little more, little more now that Facebook, you know, that we have social media. But every now and then, I'll get a phone call or I'll get a private message or something from somebody I had long forgotten. In some church that I pastored or some church maybe that I evangelized in, even as I, a single man before ever getting married. And they'll say, you may not remember, but you did this or you said that. And to this day, I'm living for God because of what he did for me at that time. And you'd have thought you'd labored in vain. But you didn't. You never have. Amen. You keep it up. 
So there's an old saying that says, do all the good you can in all the ways you can to all the folk you can at all the times you can and as long as you can. I believe it, don't you? I believe it. Lastly, let me close this out with verse 14 and 15. You know this passage well. But Zion said, that Zion is the people of God. Zion said, the Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. This is God talking to his people. The same people that had rejected him, that had given themselves to idolatry, that had turned their back on him. This is God saying, you're still my covenant people and I still love you and I'll always love you and I'm not turning my back on you. I'm making good on the promise that I made. Amen. And he uses this this picture here of a mother with a brand new child. How helpless is a brand new baby? How helpless is a brand new baby? How much does a brand new baby born into this world need the care and the strength and the touch of its mother's hand? It's got to have it. And God says, that's my relationship to you, only greater. Because he says in this passage, a woman, a woman may forget. And you know, there's nothing like the love of a mother But yet at the same time, we've seen some horrible things that mothers have done to their children. And this is what the Lord is referring to here. As great as that love is, as awesome as the love of a mother is to to her child, yet she's capable of forgetting that child. But I'll never forget you, God says. I'll never do that. And then... He goes on, by the way, that phrase, that verse 14 and 15 there, I'll never forget thee, and using the example of motherhood, uh, Bible scholars call that the glorious impossibility. (laughs) I like that. It's a glorious impossibility that the Lord would ever forget his children. The psalmist said, when my mother and father forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Amen. That's what he said in Psalm 27 and 10. He said, I will always remember thee. And then in verse 16 he says, Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. That's God speaking of his people saying, I have graven thee upon the palm of my hands. Now, now I don't, I don't, you know, God doesn't, God is spirit. God doesn't have physical hands like we have physical hands. But what the Lord is saying here is that his people, Zion, will be a constant reminder coming up before him. He will always remember them and always be mindful of them as if he were always looking at their image on his hand. And what he says to Israel, by extension, through this Messiah that he's announcing in this chapter, what he says to them, he says to the church. He says to us. It applies to us, church. That's how God feels about us. It's pretty bad out there in this world right now. It's pretty tough out there. But, oh, you get your chin up. I I guess I've been, Brother Johnny, I guess I've been kind of encouraged the last couple nights, too. Amen. God's not done. God's not finished. God's not left the throne. Amen. Stand with me. And I love him tonight and I thank him for it. In Jesus' name. Let's all do that together right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you. That you remember us. When we're discouraged, you remember us and you encourage us. When we're despondent and down and out and feel like our work is in vain, oh Lord, may we remember we do it for you in your service and answer your call. You bring about the results. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you have loved us enough that you came to this world. You answered that call. You came to this world and you gave yourself a ransom for us all. We're here tonight rejoicing in you because of your love. Thank you for it in Christ's name. Hallelujah.
Amen. Amen.